This is the High Desert Lou 3 podcast. All right, so this is the Great Big Nasty Mammoth interview, parts one and two combined. And uh, let's just ask this question. Why should you be excited about this? Well, Tyler and Jeff are uh, both my friends. Uh, Tyler is one of my students. And so I support these guys uh, in that way. But they're brand new builders, and they bring a wealth of knowledge of, uh, like, collective knowledge of gear of music. I learned so much about both of them that I was not aware of. Jeff is a guitar collector and he collects some interesting rare pieces. Tyler brings a background of like making trombones in England, um, as well as uh, like having a passion for the Pleistocene and all sorts of interesting things. But these guys are comedians. Um, I'm really looking forward to experiencing them at the next uh, uh, HDLI in June, and finally getting to see their some of their first builds. They're first-time builders. Like, this is uh, one of the things, the many things that we want to support in this community. The High Desert Luthery Invitational is not limited to experienced builders, and we will have so many first-time builders at this show, so many new builders, you know, two years, three years, five years, as well as quite a few very experienced builders. With that said, I hope you enjoy this show as much as I enjoyed uh, doing these interviews. With Luthier Tyler Jordan of Nasty Mammoth Guitars. And I was finding guitars that I, I couldn't get out of what I wanted to get out of. Like they weren't like they weren't wild enough. They weren't big enough or proud enough. There's a, a cool like saying out there basically is like let your freak flag fly you know like you're you're a very individual human being and like um you gotta showcase that you gotta you gotta appreciate that like instead of hiding that away from you know anybody else and like if you find your your place and you find your people you know like go with it full time because otherwise it's a you know a waste of your a life, basically. All right. Welcome back to the High Desert Luthery podcast. I'm Perry from Unga Guitars and the creator of the High Desert Luthery Invitational, or as we're calling it now, HDLI for short. This show will happen twice a year in celebration of luthiers, luthier-adjacent creators, musicians, and the art that comes from putting these guys together. The HDLI is a unique event that encourages support in the music community by providing free boosts to the vendors and free admission to the public. Free. The show is free. Come check it out if you're in the Albuquerque area. The event includes vendors and musicians that are curated by me to create a cohesive, organized event. The HDLI encourages community and collaboration amongst the artists. This podcast is one way to help us all get to know one another. To learn more about the show and the artist, please visit the website, highdesertluthery.com. On to today's show, uh, I'll be interviewing Tyler from Nasty Mammoth Guitars here in Albuquerque. Tyler will be one of the vendors at the HDLI 2024, June 2nd, here in Albuquerque at Rio Bravo Brewing. Yeah, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Good. I got stories to tell, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. Yeah. My name is Tyler Jordan. I'm from Roswell, New Mexico. I was born and raised there. As I grew up, I lived there pretty much my whole life until I turned 18. I did okay in school and everything, but they like can the woodshop programs and all that stuff, like the things I was kind of interested in when I was a kid. But then I uh, moved to Las Cruces in. 2006 after I turned 18 I went to uh, college at New Mexico State University down there um, I was a music major uh, so something little known fact about me or maybe a more relatively known fact about me is that uh, I'm a classically trained trombonist um, oh, wow. like I have a degree in trombone I went to New Mexico State. I wanted to be in architecture, but they didn't have an architecture program. And so I was like, well, what's my second choice? And there was no architecture programs then at that time in the state. And so my grades were not quite good enough to go elsewhere. But 
while I was there, instead of doing um, like classical music, which is kind of what I fell into, um, I wound up going to school for my second choice, which was music business. They had a music business program there, which was basically how to start and like create and run your own music business. It was essentially just a music performance degree with a minor in business. So I took a bunch of classes on accounting and the economics and uh, management styles and things like that. And it was interesting. It was not quite what I was hoping at the time. I was thinking I wanted to do something with record labels. And we all know the record industry kind of uh, went a different way around that time where everyone could start to independently produce their own music and those things were kind of becoming a thing of the past and like I got out of college and they wanted people who had degrees in finance and accounting and stuff like that um, to help them manage their money uh, but I didn't think that, that direction when I was going to college so now that brings us to uh, as part of this program I had to do an internship I did an internship, um, and th that summer, because I didn't really play any other instruments aside from a little bit of bass guitar, I really fell in love with rock and roll as a kid. My dad was a band teacher at uh, one of the schools there in Roswell, where I'm from. So UFO capital of the world. I'm sure, unfortunately, I know way too much about UFOs, you know, stuff like that, so... <laughs> But that's part of where I'm from. That's part of where I grew up, you know. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of, like, where you come from. And it's, like, sort of a, an interesting place because it's, like, halfway between being a part of New Mexico, like, um, with the culture and everything else. Like, it's definitely part of, like, the, the American Southwest, you know, like, very much. I, I know a lot about the history of where I'm from and stuff and Lincoln County and all of that. And it was all, you know, cowboys and uh, wars with Apaches and stuff like that. Like uh, and cattle rustling, like Billy the Kids from down there, like stuff like that. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's kind of a part of like what I grew up in. But like, you know, being a kid who was interested in rock and roll and I had like a very Christian family uh, growing up. And so like we didn't get the sort of regular like version of rock and roll. Like we always had to have like the, the, the Christian version of it. So it was like weird replacement bands that like no one had ever heard of. And uh, they sang songs like heavy metal songs about Jesus and stuff. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's cool. I mean, you know, whatever, uh, it just had me approach rock and roll from a very different perspective. So, you know, I was never quite cool enough to play in, like, those rock and roll bands and stuff. I was, like, a dorky white kid from, like, the middle of nowhere, USA, like, <laughs> like, um, uh, but, yeah, so I went to school. I was a little bit better at trombone than I was at bass guitar, so I got a scholarship to play in the band and stuff, and I went to this trombone convention in Salt Lake City. It was the International Trombone Convention in like 2007 or something like that. And it was at like the University of Utah. And I was there and I had found this, at the time I was kind of looking for a new trombone and I found this really cool maker that made these like beautifully like hewn handmade instruments out in England, uh, out in the north of England, uh, a, a factory. His, his, his name was Michael Rath. And if you ever go to wrathtrombones.com, like, look up his stuff. It's incredible. Uh, like, the things he makes are beautiful. They're really finely crafted. They're, like, personally tailored to you. Like, that's this whole thing. And, like, it, he does these, like, really cool designs and works. And so I was like, I got to have one. I can't afford one, but I got to have one. I've been looking very eagerly at like i've been like scrolling through the website like eagerly looking for the makers list like on who was going to be there as a vendor and uh i kept looking for his name i kept looking for his name and like it never showed up and like i was like damn like that sucks i like i don't think they're going to be a vendor and this and that and so i was a little disappointed but i was still excited to go but i was most excited about the vendors actually um and like what they had to offer in terms of 
instruments and things like that. So I I did that, and we went. It was me, and we I had a like a group of trombone players. We had like we liked to play trombone songs together and stuff. And um, it's like, well, let's all just go like take a road trip to Salt Lake City. So we go to Salt Lake City. We're talking to the vendors, and uh, I was like uh, saying something to someone. I was like, we were watching some of the competitors and stuff like that because they had like competitions, like whoever like showcases the best something like will like get a showcase and perform at this convention and stuff like that and so we're there looking and like at some of these like very best trombone player guys like coming out of jazz and like classical music and stuff like that one of the guys had a michael rath trombone he was like this jazz guy and um he uh, he got done playing and like he did a really nice job. I think he wound up winning the competition and stuff. But he had a Michael Rath trombone and I like went up to him after his performance and after the show and stuff and congratulated him on everything and uh, just like told him he did a good job because he really did. He just knocked it out of the park and so I was like, yeah, but it, you know it's kind of a shame that like. Michael Rath, like the trombone guy, is not going to be here. And he's like, what are you talking about? He's upstairs. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, he's a presenter with one of the vendors, a guy named Dylan Music. It's a, a, an outfit out of New Jersey that sells like band instruments and stuff. And he's like, you can go talk to him. Uh, so like me and my friend Jeff, who was also very interested in these things at the time, it's very much a, uh, has a part to play in this too. Uh, we kind of decided to partner up on this thing and uh, just, you know, like experiment and see what happens. Neither of us have any woodworking experience uh, previously, and we're teaching ourselves how to do all of this stuff. And uh, Perry's been a huge help in all of this. Tell me about the name of your company. Okay. So when I was in college, um, a friend and I, we were talking about like, we were talking about like the whole record label thing before everything kind of collapsed with the record industry. Uh, like we talked about like, oh yeah, let's do this together. Let's start like a little business. And we wanted to call it Nasty Mammoth Records. And and my my buddy was like, that's what we're going to name it. And I was like, okay. And I said, why? And he's like, oh, because I, I just think it sounds cool. <laughs> but it's also kind of cool because it also is the same like letters as our state. So like New Mexico. Like when I started doing this just for fun. I was like, I'm just gonna call it Nasty Mammoth Guitars. They're gonna be my ma my my guitar, like my my little weird creations. They're mostly for me experiments and, and um, like different types of wood to work with, and like what I can do with dyes and colors, and like trying to figure out, you know, how to balance like uh, the blend of like the the ergonomics of an instrument versus like the the weight distribution and some things like that that i had never really thought about before i started reading this book by uh leonardo lospinato like it's like guitar building and design something it was a textbook i bought i'm sure you probably read it too it was one that i think uh the roberto van academy required at the time um it was it was a good book and it, ta it talks a lot about that and it talks about like logo design. It talks about like how to kind of start this thing for yourself. And, but like one of the things that Perry has really helped me with is like, because I'd had, you know, some hands-on experience. Like I started working on, like I bought like the cheapest base, like imaginable. It was like a $120 base. And I think I got it for 89 bucks with the case, like through a music company, like one of those off Alibaba or something. It was junk <laughs> and uh, i got it had a twisted neck so i emailed them about like just a heads up like you sent me like an instrument with a twisted neck and like oh no big deal we'll send you another one so I'm, like suddenly i'm like okay i gotta take this thing apart and put this new thing on so they sent me a new neck and it's also twisted and warped like it's got a double like bow to it and like it's unplayable so I'm like, yeah, well, that was kind of a, a, a dead end. Um, but I got to find some way to play this thing. 
and I had it all taken apart and I had to take it apart and put it back together and all that stuff. And that got me kind of interested. It was something I was very interested in doing. Um, this is after I go uh, meet this guy, Michael Rath, and I get to talk to him and I talk to him about the internship thing. And he's like, yeah, we can make something work. And I wind up going to England to intern with this trombone maker, Michael Rath. And the whole kind of idea is like it sort of taught me the factory process and it taught me, you know, like how they ship and receive and how they find dealers and stuff like that. And uh, while I'm there in England, uh, my friend, one of the makers that worked there was like telling me, you should come see my uncle Tony's shop. One afternoon, like he takes me out to his uncle Tony's place and his uncle Tony is a luthier. And he builds violins uh, for people like all over the world uh, that look like very period style classical violins. And they're very expensive and they're very good. And the guy can sell like one instrument a month and, you know, make as much as I did in a year kind of thing. Uh, he's one of those kind of makers. Um, and so uh, he makes things like classical guitars and violins and lutes. He makes like these period English lutes. I think he has a website. His name is Anthony or Tony Johnson uh, Guitars in the UK. All right. So you mentioned that you uh, did an internship for a trombone maker in the UK. Uh, you put Nasty Mammoth together, uh, you and your friend Jeff. Tell me about how the internship working with the trombone maker influenced your work. Uh, you know, they're, they're two totally different instruments, to, but tell me how it in influences your work in Nasty Mammoth. Isn't that interesting, right? Because uh, I, I went to my friend, uh, David, who worked there at the factory at the time. Uh, he said, we should go to my uncle Tony's house. I, he, he like, he's a luthier and he makes like, you know, classical instruments and stuff. And so uh, we go in there, he teaches us, like he kind of shows us like what he does and how he carves the wood. And he like showed, he showed us these patterns of these like beautifully like ornate carved like rosettes and all this like stuff that he'd been doing. And it was just like fabulous. It was incredible. And I was blown away. Like my mind was blown. And I spent the whole uh, time in England learning about like making brass instruments to in one afternoon deciding I want to be a woodworker. Like I want to build guitars. That's what I want to do. So I've been like, uh, I, I found just cheap junky instruments. I, I would try to put them back together and make them work right and, and do everything completely wrong and screw it up and have to try again, you know, but it, it didn't matter because they were like cheap junky instruments and the goal was just to get them to sound good, you know, so, you know, it was from that time when we all had that time in our lives where we have no money. We're trying to figure out what's going on with our lives. And and so I'm like, okay, like that seems like something really fun. And I start like getting to a place where uh, I found this base and it sucked. It was broken and broken and broken. And I had to rewire the electronics and I had to uh, replace the neck and like the tuners were trash and all of this stuff because they like wouldn't hold tune to save their life. And so I had to start building these things from the ground up basically like, and just putting them together from parts that I could find. And one of the things I found was like the company Warmoth and their builds are incredible. Like they build replacement vendor parts. Their stuff is beautiful and it's like world-class craftsmanship and stuff like that. Like it's very good stuff. I know. Uh, and they have a great reputation for a good reason. And I looked at their website for their replacement bodies and necks and stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't afford this. There's no way. Like, um, and like, I, I, I got it. Like they were, you know, wonderfully crafted and everything. Um, but I was like, I, if I'm going to do this, I, you know, like I'm going to have to figure out how to do this. You know, I, I started taking some lessons with Perry on how to, you know, like cut things and what tools I needed. Well, and hey, stuff hold like on, that. Tyler. Uh, uh, you yeah. can just say with you. Everyone knows I'm Perry. Um, you mentioned that Nasty Mammoth is your company, and yeah. um, it's you and your your and, friend Jeff. What yeah. like what are your roles in the company? 
So I think for the most part, uh, I'm kind of the mad scientist character in the the pair of us. And he's like the one who like he kind of starts putting things together. Like he figures out he's gotten like really into doing this too. And he got some really neat equipment, uh, some of those shaper tools and some things like that. And he's been uh, putting some things uh, together as well. Through this, we're both teaching ourselves woodworking and teaching ourselves how to like build something functional that like looks nice, especially like if it's artistic and very uh, unique. So uh, the guitars we build uh, tend to be very Southwest inspired, but like with that rock and roll twist, like we really want something that's going to look like that's nuts. I got to play that, you know, and I think uh, that it's going to, you know, uh, help us out, you know, in, in long term. Like I've got some designs and I've got some ideas and stuff that I'm uh, trying to bring to fruition. And um, we're, you know, just trying to build some stuff uh, based on some designs we already recognize uh, just to help, you know, ourselves learn the trade. And then we're going to, you know, make a bunch of crazy shapes and uh, do whatever we want. Uh, that shaper tool is like a CNC kind of computer tool. It's really cool. And it will uh, do things, you know, uh, really well for you. And then I have the more old school shop where um, I do everything by hand. He is kind of the doer. I'm kind of the thinker of the of the crew. I think that's kind of the idea is like, he's really great at putting like feet to ideas and stuff. Um, more like I would kind of let it peter out on an idea only sometimes. And so he's he's very fast about that stuff, and he's very studious, and he like figures things out quickly, and he's incredibly talented and smart, and he's also <laughs> a classically trained trombonist from New Mexico State University, but that's where we met. We also have another side of this, which is we have Nasty Mammoth Records, and that's actually the thing that uh, my friend and I, I uh, Isaac, he runs the Nasty Mammoth Records, and uh, so our goal for this upcoming show is to have a whole lot of stuff completed to showcase and uh, try. And we're going to have some pretty cool things there uh, to test them on and stuff like that. Uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for, you know, old vintage weirdo amps. And I wound up finding some like in <laughs> Roswell uh, when I lived there the second time after I went to get my master's degree like I came back to Roswell because I was like kind of in transition looking for, you know, a job and something to do. And I wound up like going pawn shopping and going to thrift stores and stuff like that. And I'd find uh, yard sales and I, I found some like cool old uh, like vintage electronics, stuff like uh, Jack White plays in the White Stripes. And uh, they have some really cool tonal characteristics and and so I wound up kind of inadvertently collecting some antique electronics and stuff that you kind of really can't find much anymore. And I might have some of those for sale and some things like that, too. So I, I think it's going to be kind of fun, like based on some of the the things that we're going to try to accomplish with this next show. Earlier, you mentioned uh, about design. You mentioned design and how you were you know, pulling from stuff that is uh, like current designs that are more traditional. Um, can you talk to me more about where you're pulling inspiration in your designs? And then how would you describe uh, a Nasty Mammoth guitar? <laughs> so um, a Nasty Mammoth guitar, I decided when I was thinking about this uh, a long time ago, it was like, um, I just want to do something... That is essentially like uh, something you want just like hanging on your wall to like look at and enjoy like a work of art, you know, but also to be functional and user friendly and, you know, um, sound unlike anything else you've ever played. Like you got to hang on to it. Like this thing is cool. It looks good. Um, it's crazy. It's wild. I uh, love the look of like psychedelic stuff and southwestern inspired things and I, I know like i love those navajo rug patterns and um i love turquoise you know like any proper uh new mexican what i suppose 
and then of course I love history. So like prehistory is a part of that, you know, and I remember going to some museums and stuff around here and like seeing petrified wood and seeing all these crazy things, you know, growing up around the Southwest and uh, like thinking that's just kind of where I want to be. And that's how I kind of wound up in Albuquerque. I was living in California and it was beautiful. I, I, I did love it, but it was also like, I missed home, you know? And so I just wanted to come back and be a little closer to family and friends and stuff like that that I'd uh, known throughout my life. And um, it's, it's a good thing. Like, and that's how I wound up lucking into the, the space that I get to work out of. So I'm kind of grateful to the people around here. That's part of the reason, like, I like to be here. It's like kind of a big family uh, environment and very, like, exciting and cool and stuff. And, like, I, I, I inspire my designs off of some of that, like, old... Uh, we used to live really close to, uh, like, growing up, was uh, really close to the Mescalero Apache Reservation and stuff. So we were all, always up through there. And uh, one year they brought us up here to Albuquerque when I was in middle school to see that great big powwow, uh, Gathering of Nations. And, like, we got to see, like, all these, like, traditional, like, dancing. You know, it's, it's a really cool music scene. And the thing that always fascinated me, too, was the vendors. Is, like, I wanted to know, like, what you're doing and, like, you know, how, like, your booth is... The funny thing is I've like never been something like Nam. I think my brother went and he said it was a bit overwhelming. Like there's just so many vendors and you don't know where to stop and what to do and what to look at and stuff like that. But uh, we had a really fun environment the last one for sure. I, I really enjoyed it. I hope people, you know, are interested in kind of uh, trying my stuff when it's done. And I've been working on uh, getting those specific things finished. And one... Uh, it was a simple wiring issue. One was um, the, the the base neck uh, just didn't quite have a nut. And like there was a couple little things. And so I got to just finalize a few parts of it. Uh, and, um, that's part of what I'm working on at the moment is getting those last things done uh, for those. And then I'm going to start laying into my own designs uh, very soon. Perry's, you've been helping me with... Um, <laughs> your uh like your expertise and knowledge and uh i guess i'm like talking like i think people are like listening to us on the radio or something <laughs> so um <laughs> it's really exciting and i'm like finally getting a chance to uh stop and do this you know full time like uh and uh fortunately i'm here but unfortunately i am kind of disabled so I move kind of slow on some things, which is a bummer. I know that's like, I probably should admit that on, you know, the podcast, but. It's just... totally fine. It's all a part of who you are. And you yeah. know, that part of honesty is uh, is a really good thing. You know, the whole point of doing this show is to help us get to know one another. And there's all sorts of different walks of life that are attracted to playing instruments as well as making instruments. Um, so you mentioned something earlier about, how you want your guitars, these nasty mammoth guitars, to sound like no other or, um, you know, like nothing you've heard. What do you mean by that? What are your goals tonally? So my goals tonally, uh, especially, I think, with bass guitar, is it's kind of a blend of things. So uh, mostly kind of like a, a rock and roll vibe, but will clean up really well. Like as in like you can play this, you know, like both at like one event and then go to like a dive bar and play at another event kind of thing. Two totally can different you, like genres and stuff. Can you describe that rock and roll sound? Because I know your depth of knowledge and gear and, okay. and um, recording and uh, it's just so deep. Um, you know, yeah. for those of us who are kind of new or just to be more clear, can you describe what that sound is? So the way I think about uh, the sound is in terms of the equalization, right? The, the EQ of what you want to pull out of your instrument. And some instruments, I, I remember uh, there was a time where I had bought this Fender Precision Bass. It was a, like a nice Made in America one. I never even got a chance to plug it in because the preamp was dead and I wound up getting rid of it. But... 
the the thing was like it sounded incredible just acoustic and it was just a hunk of wood and it got me thinking like well okay like how does wood like how does the mix of wood you know and stuff like that affect the sound profile and me and you have talked about like sometimes like you get all the right parts together and it just still sounds like you're kicking a box you know and it just is what it is and like you you take that neck off that guitar and you put it on another guitar and it sounds magical you know it's just sometimes things don't talk to each other very well and there's kind of a give and a take you know to every part of the equation right like uh your balance and your weight distribution like you want your instruments to sit comfortably like when you're sitting down playing and like i think about like a classical guitar you know and like how a classical guitar player they kind of almost play upright because it's almost like a cello style instrument uh loop players are like that too so i think about that a lot it's like i want like a guitar and like i have like a, I was in a car crash a few years ago and it broke my back <laughs> and I had to like relearn how to walk and stuff. It was tough, but um, it taught me some good things too, which were um, resilience on like figuring some stuff out and getting a chance to start over in a weird way. And so now we're at a point where I found this shop and uh, uh, I was taking some like woodworking classes through uh, CNM and just like teaching me how to use like big tools and stuff like that. And Perry, uh, you're really good at helping me, you know, learn how to use these things, which is really cool. And I love that there's like a community involvement. Like we're, we're like, I remember seeing this meme one time and it was a, a it was a clove of garlic. It was a picture of a clove of garlic. Right. And there was a slice of a tangerine sitting in there. <laughs> and it says, just because you fit doesn't necessarily mean you belong, you know? And, like, it's like, okay. Like, I want the things that do stand out, though. Like, and I feel like I, I'm finding a community of, like, you know, people through this uh, that are, like, you know, your people. Like, you got to find your people. And, like, it's, it's kind of interesting because I think that's part of, like why we're putting all this together is like we have a better connection like throughout the community and stuff, uh, especially when there's so many other people interested in it and then also interested in like, you know, craft artists and goods. Like it's not a manufacturing company. That's one thing I'll say. We don't spit out guitars uh, like, a you know, like 1200 at a time or whatever. It's definitely a small time operation. I think we all are, uh, especially around here. So I know Perry is really fast at building. I have a question for you. How do you like build so quickly? Is it just because of practice and practice is a big part of it. Is practice? Um, yeah, and then also um I would say being or having experience working on a manufacturing line making guitars is also a very important part uh, or has a heavy influence in how i run my shop i yeah i just resonate with that quality and i and i think you know working with the sense of urgency you know time is time matters is a big thing that can often get left out and you know there's no right or wrong way to do it but like to kind of talk about myself as a person a little bit i'm fairly impatient about things and I don't mind getting after it, you know, and, and uh, really figuring out ways to work more efficiently, work faster in some situations. And so that's kind of like what has shaped the speed that I work at. Uh, you know, the other side of that is just a, sort of a, a mental game I play with myself, which is where I start feeling tired. I push harder. And so I, I you know, thing. I'm like, no, oh, come on, Tyler. You can, you got it. Like a couple more steps in and you got like, uh, like one more task in you and you're done. Like you have like a little carrot and it's like, okay, like this is, but I'm going to push. I'm going to make this happen, you know? And also like not getting uh, flustered and frustrated in a mistake. I used to take this way too seriously and, and you've gotten on to me about it before, <laughs> which is like, I get too worried about the piece of wood. Like who cares? Like, you know what, like, it's a hunk of wood at the end of the day. Like, if it ruins, sometimes you just chuck it in the bin and try again. 
It's like, yeah, you know, I, I tried to fix it. It didn't fix and it's no bueno. I can use it for, you know, uh, scrap for something else next time. And there's always a purpose behind it. And that's kind of a cool thing about carpentry in general is like the ability to reuse stuff, you know, uh, like in a smart way. Uh, how, speaking of Perry, uh, how uh, does your like shop layout play out into the, it, the importance, like how, how to balance like your floor process? Uh, workflow. Um, no, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, workflow, so, yeah, man. That's what I call that. Um, uh, you know, workflow, if you have enough room, workflow is a strategic thing. Otherwise, uh, you're just working with what you have. So uh, my current situation, having all of my shop in uh, part of a one-car garage, it is what it is. You work with what you have. But, you know, if I had a, oh, a, sure. a big, giant shop to work with, then, you know, ideally I'm working in some sort of a circuit essentially a, a, an efficient pass through the shop to go from process to process and also to allow for like proper ventilation, dust collection, that sort of thing. You know, ideally you're working in as straight of a line as possible, but you know, that's not really, that's not realistic. So um, that's something that's always changing and, and growing um, as tools uh, get acquired or replaced and, uh, or upgraded. Um, so like, that's, that's a, mm -hmm. it's a living thing, uh, in, in every shop I've ever been in, um, for sure, for sure. So, uh, can you tell me about your current, uh, guitar, like your custom design? Yeah. So my current custom design is something I, I am calling, I'm calling it the Tusk just cause like I, I, the idea was like. I kind of want it to look like a, you know, a woolly mammoth kind of tusk, you know, thing. And I have a few other, like, I, I'm just kind of basing things around this sort of prehistoric, like, Ice Age idea and a lot of uh, minerals and stones and things like that from this uh, era. They, they always find a whole lot of that kind of thing, uh, woolly mammoths and things like that. They find a lot of those things, like in particularly like the Southwest region. I, I've always found that kind of interesting. And so, you know, growing up, I always saw all these like Neolithic things, uh, like, and was very inspired by them. And, and so, like I said, I, I want my pieces to be like almost one of a kind uh, and sound like no other. So I like, I get these uh, like pickups that, like I, I've never seen before and I've been working also with uh, a pickup maker uh, that I found and I, I want to kind of help showcase some of his pickup designs too because he does some pretty wild things with humbuckers his name is Zach Manley and so I would like to you know also build a community we are all part of this and we're all building together and like we want to you know, especially showcase our fellow craftsmen's wares. Uh, I think that's a really cool thing. And that's why I like uh, putting together like a vendor booth is a really fun thing. And I've done on the like a little bit larger scale because while I was there, I wound up doing a, a, a vendor booth um, at a the same trombone festival that next year. It was in uh, Aarhus, Denmark. And I went again, and I went as a, a, a vendor showcase with uh, Michael Rath trombones and met a bunch of, you know, like really interesting people, like European makers and things like that. And it was a, definitely an experience. So, like, they, they had, a, like, a really big booth, and they we took a whole bunch of, you know, vendor gear and instruments and stuff like that over the showcase in Denmark from England. And... Like I said, uh, you know, you want you want to hear stories. That's also something I like about the Southwest is stories, man. Like, uh, you hear stories unlike anywhere else around here. I feel like you know, um, the American West is kind of a an odd thing. I'm also like very influenced by you know, um, like sludge and doom metal type stuff, and I want things to sound like. Um, I always use sound examples. So, like, uh, let's say you want to sound like the dude from the Melvins, like. 
okay, like I want, like I want my uh, my sounds to come out as like really, you know, fuzzed out and like kind of bass forward, and um, you know, like that means you got to design an instrument that's gonna give it that. You know, like uh, uh, there's a YouTube channel. It's like a car thing, and like when they like put the pedal to the metal, like they put the pedal to the floor. They call it give give it the beans. And I always like that. It's like, yeah, just give it the beans. Like, you know, if you want to push it hard, like it's going to be, you know, big and ugly and in your face. But if you want to trim it back, you can also clean it up some and make it sound really good. And so I always like looking for versatile instruments and versatile pickups and versatile designs and stuff like that with like my own sort of flavor to them. Um, you know, like a sort of like a New Mexico cook, like we put, green chili and everything you know i know uh <laughs> some people hate that some people love that you know but uh it's just one of those things i remember reading this uh cook thing one time and it was talking about that same thing was like uh like new mexico like or like cuisines ranked from like lowest to highest across the states and I was like, oh, New Mexico's going to be way up there somewhere. And it was like number 37. It's like, yeah, like it's the same as everywhere else. They just put green chili on it, you know. It's like, yeah, they're kind of right. But um, so I always like to add a little bit of green chili to my designs and flavors too. That's just the New Mexico in me. Very cool, very (laughs) cool. Where do you uh, see Nasty Mammoth in the next two years? Where would you like to be? I'd like to be a little bit more uh, like able-bodied uh, in the next two years. I, I've been actively doing a lot of like physical therapy and uh, occupational therapy and stuff like that. Um, but I still got to take it kind of slow at the time. I know you just suffered an accident uh, recently too. Like makes you stop and like you don't want to. And so you like, you have to balance like what you can do with what you can't do too um but realistically i, I want to see the shop more able-bodied i am still working on the production layout for the shop like this is definitely a good shop where like you know like one or two people could work efficiently and stuff like that and i'd like to you know um start building things of a really good quality and that people really enjoy playing and that sound you know wacky and wild and they're you know cool colors and um that's something that i like uh i'm learning more about is uh the dye process you know and like what takes and what doesn't and like what sands out and what doesn't and like how you like you know put colors down in certain you know orders and stuff like that um and then sand them back to get what you want and it's it's a really fun process like that's something i I really like to play with is the color of the like the guitar bodies and uh even the guitar necks at some point too you know like i might start like taking you know i have a i found a bunch of uh really good maple um and i might you know um do something like that with the necks at some point too would be fun um but yeah i have a bunch of wood and a bunch of ideas and um like i like to do designs that you know um may seem familiar uh but also you know um like rethink the process and like make things balance out better and uh work better together and things like that so you know if you guys ever i will i will say anybody who's listening you know if you're ever looking for instruction on this stuff um i'm gonna i'm gonna plug Unga Guitars, uh, Perry here, like he, uh, he is a, a good teacher. He'll show you some neat tricks and stuff like that. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, so like I said, I, I came from like very little woodworking experience to like, you know, uh, now suddenly like, <laughs> you know, quite you, like you learn it so fast. I just like watched woodworking videos and like bowl turning videos and things like that. It's like cathartic, you know, I'm sure you're there. Like uh, if you're ever like on like YouTube, said, I want to know how to do a thing. And then like you watch how to do that thing and like you're not paying attention and the next video starts and it's like, you know, some other thing. It's like, oh, that's interesting. I want to know that too, you know, and you go down this rabbit hole on like and then just like wind up watching like i could probably fall asleep watching people like turn uh bowls on 
<laughs> lathes and stuff like it's you know like it becomes a very cathartic exercise too and it's like something that really helps me focus and it like it was one of those things where like I, I felt like I found my calling when I started doing it myself and I was finding guitars that I, I couldn't get out of what I wanted to get out of like they weren't wild enough they weren't big enough or proud enough there's a, a cool saying out there basically is like let your freak flag fly you know like you're you're a very individual human being and like um you gotta showcase that you gotta you gotta appreciate that like instead of hiding that away from you know anybody else and like if you find your your place and you find your people you know like go with it full time because otherwise it's a uh, you know a waste of your a life basically so oh, nasty mammoth is up on instagram is that correct yeah we're on instagram right now we're working on a website but we want to have um a few uh finalized things uh to put up there to showcase and jeff you know he's teaching himself the process down in phoenix with his shop tools as well so like i said i'm kind of the the old school guy and he's kind of the dude with all the tech and so he's kind of figuring out how to do uh, a more uh, refined manufactured process as well. So if we, you know, ever get to a place where we can grow, like we can definitely use it to grow and not mass produce, but more, uh, more quickly um, fabricate instruments if people want them, you know. But yeah, we're definitely working in the process of that. We're working on building out our booth for showcase and stuff like that we're working on um uh, our our logo and our label you know and labeling process on the headstock or on the guitar somewhere and so in that sense we're also like moving forwards like pieces at a time and like okay you know it's more of a like okay i had to spend a bunch of time down here building it first and then as as i go i can spend a little less time on it and you know, like there, but it's still important, you know, so like building up our, our, our actual brand as an identity is a, uh, something that we're, we're working on doing too. Like we, we're, um, we're getting closer with some stuff and like, we're working on, uh, inlay ideas and we're working on, um, some of the different patterns and like what, what things work and what things kind of don't work and, uh, so like but but the the whole goal ultimately is like we're going to give you an instrument the likes of which you've never seen or felt and played before but it's all you want to play now you know but then you can hang it on your wall and like stare at it at night you know and let it put you lull you to sleep well, that's a great goal to have uh that that is a <laughs> wonderful goal to have i appreciate you taking the time to talk with me this morning yeah man i haven't uh had the chance to catch up with you in a, a few weeks Oh no, uh, we've both kind of been down for the count, and then it got really cold. I, uh, everyone uh, here uh, sounds like around Albuquerque in New Mexico, like northern New Mexico area, got hit pretty hard there too. And so, like, I actually had to move some of my shop in indoors because my shop is not insulated. It's very cold. <laughs> so sometimes it'll be like freezing outside, like twenty degrees, and I come in the shop and it's even colder. You know, it's like, oh, like this is not going to warm up, you know. When it's too cold to work outside, I'll bring the guitar inside and I'll start, you know, playing around on it. But, yeah, just, you know, um, continuing the process. So I'm teaching myself the, the myself these steps. And uh, I mess, you know, like we all always, like there's nothing in this world that's ever going to be perfect, you know. Like the closest thing you'll get is machine made anyway, and that always loses some of that, for me at least, always loses some of that um, inherent sort of uh, workmanship. Like it shows that like, you know, no artist is perfect. And, you know, like I, I definitely come at this from an artist perspective. Like I, I went to, a um, when I got my master's, I went to a place called California Institute of the Arts. And um, it was uh, out in LA. It was a very important school out there on the West coast. And, you know, like all the, the bigger artists from the area and from the region would always come to study there under certain professors and stuff. And so, you know, that's kind of where my, 
process comes from is like spending a lot of time in classes like where they had to talk to you about aesthetic and like thinking about you know art and like what it means you know and like how it represents and that kind of thing um i love functional artwork so basically uh artwork that you can use and that you want to use you know like they're they're also they're not just beautiful pieces they're also tools and uh, you can use them to you know create what it, whatever you want to create and i want things that inspire you to create you know very good tyler very good thanks for coming Hi, on man. and um and i will catch up with you soon yeah yeah we'll talk soon all right you guys take care all right, thanks bye-bye bye-bye and luthier jeff stewart of nasty mammoth guitars yeah the the bass that tyler's making is it's pretty wacky. <laughs> the fingerboard inlays are uh, colored from coal from the Titanic. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> I haven't heard anything about this. Oh my god! I'll, I'll probably talk to him tomorrow, and we'll see. I'll 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 get caught up on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. Cool. It, it sounds fitting to Nasty Mammoth. That's great. All right, this is uh, my interview with Jeff Stewart, who is the second half of Nasty Mammoth. So in uh, ways, this is uh, Nasty Mammoth interview part two. And uh, he talks about his uh, love for collecting oddball guitars, as well as setting up shop as a brand new builder. And it was uh, great to spend some time talking to Jeff. So I hope you enjoy. All right, I am joined here by the other half of Nasty Mammoth, Jeff Stewart. And uh looks like he's got one of the, the newest creations. You want to go ahead and talk about that since you've got it right there? Over the summer here, Tyler, Jordan, and I started building guitars. And you know, Tyler's been into it for quite a long time, and he got me into it. And when I got back to Phoenix from Albuquerque, I started having withdrawals from like cutting things so uh i started you know building up all the tools that i needed to to build a guitar one at a time and uh this is the result of that uh i started off with a pick guard that i found at a pawn shop and i was like that thing's awesome and it had um some rio grand pickups in it and and tyler's those are so cool I'm like yeah they, they are pretty neat got these big pole pieces in them so they look really nice and then um so i was kind of limited to a strap format just because of the pick guard but i didn't want to make it look like a strap so since i sometimes like to hold my guitar like classical style you know kind of like that just a little cut out here to uh put in on my leg and play a little bit more comfortably when I feel like it. Uh, then uh, I, I really wanted to build it out of one piece of wood. So um, I happened to find a piece of bubinga because, you know, those trees are gigantic. So not hard to find a, a big piece of that, but I uh, found a, a piece of bubinga and started um, making shape from it. So at this it turned out really nice i mean uh, right on that's my first time seeing it how much does it weigh i mean bobinga's pretty heavy <laughs> yeah it's heavy uh, it's, it's it's not for the uh not for the week the uh, the only thing i really decided to do totally different would be the bridge I really didn't want a tremolo bridge uh i'm pretty picky about guitars being in tune so that was something that I wanted was a, a hard tail. And what hard tail did you use on that? It's the Schaller 3DS. It's pretty cool. Oh, you can yeah. adjust these little wheels here and you can go side to side, up and down, back yeah. and forth, right? Yep. Cool. Very cool. I used that bridge on a build a while back and um I, I thought that function was really fun uh, to be able to go side to side 
and then they started rolling as I was playing and my <laughs> team spacing started to change and um, I didn't pick the bridge. It was the uh, the guy that ordered the guitar, but I was like, okay, I'm not doing this again. I, don't know. I just thought it was a cool idea. And since it was my first guitar, I was like, well, there's a lot more room for error if I can adjust it in every direction. <laughs> Yeah, great to have that room for flexibility for sure. So let's talk about the brand, uh, Nasty Mammoth. So I interviewed Tyler, and I learned about his deep knowledge of Roswell, uh, as well as uh, I learned a little bit about the Pleistocene and uh, how he's influenced by uh, Native American uh, culture, nature, and New Mexico culture and how he feels like those things have a strong impact on the Nasty Mammoth guitars and the designs. Can you weigh in on what influences, uh, you know, you guys as a pair, like how you feel like the team quality comes together? Uh, Cause like, uh, and to be more specific, I feel like Tyler, uh, what he was saying, and, and I can sort of agree with it in, in knowing you guys, um, like he's kind of like uh, the dreamer or the idea guy, and it seems like uh, you just make shit happen. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, like, can you elaborate on that a little bit and tell me, like, what your role is? Well, uh, all of this came down to Tyler to begin with. He, you know, got me hooked on guitars. Uh, we were roommates, and he would play all the time. He just got into it, and he got me into it. And I started learning via Rocksmith and bought a guitar and it's a downhill uh, slope from there. Um, but as far as the um, New Mexico influence, I feel like uh, New Mexico has some, the people from New Mexico really identify with it a lot. We see a lot of tattoos or <laughs> five, seven, five, you know, it has its own distinct accent. It's, it's a very unique place. Um, so we decided we want to take aspects of that and bring that into our instruments. So with my first attempt, for example, I put turquoise uh, Zia symbols going up the fretboard. As turquoise has a lot to do with New Mexico, same thing with the Zia symbol and uh, Native American culture. Um, and just a nasty mammoth. I don't know the entire origin story of where Tyler got it from, but I know he, he at least went with NM because he, he liked that it was for uh, New Mexico. That kind of brings up another question I had, which was the origin. Uh, and I thought in the interview he had mentioned that you came up with the name. Uh, but... <laughs> nope, nope. Isaac came up with it back in college, and they were trying to do their uh, like nasty mammoth records. I see what he went to school for. Yeah. So I know that you guys are, are friends and have been friends for a long time. Um, how did you get involved, you know, with the, with the nasty mammoths as a guitar label? So for a long time, uh, Tyler had been down on his luck more than most people. So he hadn't really had an opportunity to um, go for what he loved doing, which was, everything about guitars i mean he would research it and play them and one day I asked, i'm like hey man how much do you think it would cost for you to just build me a guitar well, let's see what you can do and then it started what ended up like getting you more involved was it just visiting the shop that summer and uh and i mean i was there too um was it was it that visit that like just made you like pull the trigger and be like i want to be more involved with this yeah came down and he showed me all of it and got me involved and in doing a few things like this is cool it's it's really neat to be able to just you know take a block of wood and create something you know that looks pretty and can play music at the same time so so you're in phoenix like uh and tyler's here in albuquerque or while well, you're in the phoenix area um so like, how does that affect um, how you guys make decisions about things? Like, how do you work out that way? Like, how do you work those things out? There we go. There it is. So it's hours and hours of sitting on the phone, designs, 
and then just kind of delving up what we want to do. So he's making a base uh, for somebody, and um, I made the fretboard and got the body cut for him and helped him make the design and then took that over to him, and he can get the rest of it going. Okay. Did you end up like setting up a whole wood shop at home or like what, what tools did you end up getting? Uh, the first thing that I got, I like technology way too much and uh, it's kind of like a CNC machine, but you can basically make a template and the router not let you make a mistake. Cut it and it turns out perfect every time. So that, that's what I started with. And I thought, well, that would be great because I can make fretboards. I and it'll just I can make whatever design I want and just go through, use that, and I can make some pretty interesting things. And then as it got further along, I got a bandsaw, I got a planer, jointer, just everything. Sanders, it's it's a whole thing now. <laughs> Oh, right on. And so are you are you cutting the fret slots uh, with the CNC router? Uh, so I, I made like a, a very shallow line of where they would go. And then I used a uh, saw. A hand saw? Fret saw for that. Okay. Yeah. Got gotcha. Wow, the long, the long game. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I can't. I do it now and then with the fan fret stuff, but I can't. Uh, I just I table saw. I, I I can't sit there and saw those slots out. Like just drives me crazy. I I have to like just say, all right, you're not going to do anything fun until you get this done, and uh, you know, so get it done. Uh, I'm I'm just used <laughs> to it taking like like two minutes, you know, at at the most, and um, I I respect everyone that is willing to do it by hand. Yeah, took a long time. <laughs> yep, been there. Gosh, I don't know why I keep doing it that way. I really don't. Um, I'm sure there's someone who's figured it out, you know, who has a, a rig for doing uh, multi-scale stuff with a table saw and with templates. So it's just too many moving parts. Like when I try and imagine it, I'm like, nah, nah we'll just yeah, keep that doing it the like... long way. You know, and I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have a CNC router of any type yet. And uh, even then, I'm like, it's so much easier to connect the dots and saw it than, like, write a program to do it. Like, I, I got to do too many things to get this, like, going. I could draw this out in, like, 30 seconds. Let's just do it. Let's just <laughs> do it this way and quit complaining. Um, do you guys have any names for the models that you're building yet? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I was listening to another podcast and they were talking about all these um, fossils that were being found up in Alaska of animals that lived in the Pleistocene era and a, a lot of like woolly mammoth tusks and bones and brains and weird things. So you know, I kind of got into that and I was like, you know, if we're going with nasty mammoth, we can just kind of take other animals from that era they all have cool names so um yes we do for sure <laughs> do you, you want do you have a name for that one that you're holding uh, i actually haven't put a name on this one yet have no clue and was that the uh the interview on the joe rogan show about that big fossil pit <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, I I heard that same one. I was like, oh man, that sounds that's that, that sounds pretty wild. They got all the saber tooth cat skulls and uh, right and all that stuff. Right on. Yeah, I think we had agreed that we would make this one the dire wolf, but haven't decided yet completely. Oh uh, yeah, so I see like strat flavors in there. Uh, well, let's just be specific. Uh, super strat flavors. With the double cut, and I see some uh, uh, Parker flavors with the headstock. Uh, can you talk about what influenced you on that body style? Uh, well, I was just kind of, I was very limited in that it needed to be strat like because of the pit guard. Um, but something that we had done earlier was since 
we had just started designing them with Tyler, he kind of had this kind of horn shape design on some of the other guitars. And so I wanted to incorporate that as well as a little cutaway so that I could hold it on my lap classical style. And then the headstock, um, just, you know, when you look at headstocks, there's kind of a lack of variety as with bodies of guitars, but I just wanted something a little bit different. That's worked really well. And what is the material of the back of the neck? Uh, Purple Heart. All right, cool. And uh, it looks like you got a pretty thick finish on there. What are you using for a finish? So I tried a whole bunch of different finishes, and I couldn't find one that I liked. Um, I ended up going over to the auto parts store and just looking through theirs to see if they had um, something that could give a, a nice high gloss finish, but be pretty like durable. And uh, it's actually like lacquer for a car. Automotive lacquer is what the guitar industry was built on. Um, you know, that's what Fender started spraying to get all those cool colors. And uh, and it's a funny thing. You know, it was never designed for guitars. And uh, it was designed for metal, metal surfaces that, you know, aren't necessarily porous. Um, and so we just kind of make do with what's available. Glossy finish was basically why you went that way. Um, it wasn't necessarily for any uh, tonal goals or uh, feel. Nope, just wanted it to be shiny. Right on, right on. It comes up uh, frequently with talking to other builders about, you know, why they make decisions and what kind of finishes are you using, you know, what brands do you like, all this stuff. So I, I always, uh, I, I try and make it a point to ask uh, builders about that. Um so yeah, you're fairly new to guitar making. Do you have a favorite material to work with yet? I, I have a uh, least favorite for sure, which would be Purple Heart. I got some nasty, nasty uh, splinters from that. <laughs> like an inch long one in my hand. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that, that uh, the green structure on that will really get into you. <laughs> it can be so vicious. Beyond that, you know, they're all pretty similar besides how they end up when you're um, playing them. I mean, I, I mean, you got to have different saw blades for some, but as far as working with them, it's all the same it's as long as it, you get to the output you want. Okay. Um, so did you carve that neck or did Tyler carve that neck? Uh, I did. I, I built a neck jig uh, using my CNC router. And you can t put a router on it and slide it back and forth and turn the neck and slide it and it goes through and makes whatever shape you want. Oh, okay. So did you end up having to refine the profile at, at all or did you just go with it? Yeah. Uh, at, at first when I put it together, I, I thought it was too thick. So and then from there, just a lot of sanding by hand to get it to where I want it. I see. I see. It's a very interesting approach to me because uh, I, you know, I do stuff by hand and a lot of the other builders do stuff by hand. So like you got this guitar together quick and I was like, how the fuck did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wow. Did he learn? I, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't talk a whole lot while we were all at Tyler's shop together. Like, Oh, that's that's cool. Like, I wonder how he did it, what he did, you know. And Tyler was sort of filling me in on what was happening, um, and I was just like, "Oh, well, we'll see it when we see it." That that's neat. And um, this last time when you were in town, I was I wasn't doing anything because I was injured. Um, so, like, uh, Nasty Mammoth is fairly new to the world, uh, along with a bunch of the other builders that were at this last show that we did. What do you think would be a good goal? What are your goals for Nasty Mammoth in the next couple of years? I guess there's a couple of different goals. The whole view of it is that there are so many guitars in this world, and that's it. You know, you can choose whatever you like, as long as it's a Stratocaster or a Les Paul PRS in any color you want. So you we're know, like, well, well, we're going to make something a little different. And it's going to be 
what we like and it's going to be a little out there um so each one of them is going to be unique for sure from the pickups to the hardware oh maybe not all of the hardware but they're going to be very interesting instruments uh tyler's getting hand wound pickups from different independent pickup makers that are pretty cool like righteous sound pickups and manly um so eventually we will have you know a few different models and bodies that put out into the world and see what people think right Um, on as far as um what i will probably end up doing i mean besides making these uh, i collect interesting guitars and uh, currently i'm just offering them up to the musical instrument museum to show them but eventually i'm probably going to start selling them but I, I have some pretty bizarre ones i mean i could show you a couple here i know we're talking about our brand but um there's some other people doing some pretty cool things it's got fiber optic uh laser for the frets on the side it's just the paint job on it is just incredible like super cool with fishman pickups in it yeah it's it's a badass thing this one's uh minaret guitars it's uh pegasus on the inlay german carve all around it really cool pick guard kind of floats on top a unicorn up on top Yeah, interesting guitars. I'll show you one more. (laughs) This one is by uh, Luthier Jose Gallo out of New York. And he makes these LED light-up guitars. And it's got a MIDI touch controller here. I think the battery on it's dead. Otherwise, I'd show you it lit up. It's absolutely insane. (laughs) It's really cool. Very, very unique uh, instruments for sure. So uh, do you feel like, you know, collecting these guitars and being into these sorts of builds, do you feel like um, uh, you're pulling influence from a lot of these uh, oddball guitars that you've collected? Uh, Yeah, definitely. Um, Can I replicate anything that they do? Absolutely not. Each one of those people is an expert in their own niche world. Like Jose Gallo. He's a master of working with electronics and lights. And I opened that thing up and went, oh, my God, I should put this back together right now. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would never get it back together. Or like the, <laughs> the um, Gorilla Guitars. Like, who thinks of having a laser as your side dots on your guitar? Like, it's so cool. Uh, there's other ones. I have one from Bulletproof Guitars. It's got a Kevlar top. Um, yeah. I have way too many. <laughs> All right, on Jeff. So now we're going to get on to the low-hanging fruit of uh, the interview here. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few silly questions. And uh, so I love the nasty mammoth name. And you brought up that, uh, you know, the initials NM, you know, also New Mexico. And I think that's very clever. Uh, which which one are you? Are you nasty or are you the mammoth? I'm gonna guess uh, nasty on that one. <laughs> right on. We'll, we'll let Tyler be the mammoth of it. <laughs> I'm sure he won't mind either way. <laughs> <laughs> this is too funny. Um, uh, you know, Tyler talked about uh, trombones a whole lot um in in the interview and uh are you also a trombonist uh yeah uh my degrees are in bass trombone performance right on and so your uh music teacher is that correct yep i teach high school band orchestra guitar and jazz band right on yeah i like to ask people you know all the different uh people i'm interviewing about you know what they do for work uh because oftentimes there's this idea that you know we're all making guitars full time and that's why we can manage to finish something or get something made so you know full time gig and uh and you whipped out a guitar pretty quick like how long did it take you to 
um, make that guitar you showed us earlier? Well, I started in August and I wanted it to get done before the uh, show. That was my goal. So I got it done just before then, but I, I got sick and couldn't come out. So uh, that was unfortunate. Uh, but, uh, you know, now maybe three, three months. Right on. Right on. Very cool. Every well, day after work. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, thanks for joining me today, Jeff, and um, thanks for tolerating my uh, my bad jokes. And uh, <laughs> uh, let me know next time you're in town, um, and hopefully you can bring that guitar with you. And I'd love to see it, check it out, um, you know, see the progress, because this is kind of the first nasty mammoth build that I know of that's been completed, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have like six or seven others that are just. They're so close to being done, and every step of the way we get there, and it's just something else kind of gets in the way. But it's really close on on quite a few of them. Yeah, you guys, uh, if you don't sell anything before the show, you guys are going to have a, a quite the uh, quite the arrangement. Yeah, should be pretty neat. Right on. Well, thanks, Jeff, and um, you have a great rest of your evening. Uh, you too, and congratulations on putting on the uh, High Desert Lou 3 Invitational. You got the poster there behind you I hear It's pretty cool. Thanks for helping me and Tyler. I mean, literally, we would know where about you. So your uh, wisdom and expertise and uh, love for the subject is much appreciated. Well, thank you for that. I uh, enjoy hanging out with you guys. It's neat to finally see a, a build from you guys uh, being like a brand new uh, company, brand new Luthiers, you know, see the first creation and see the other builds going along. And, and I look forward to seeing what you guys bring to the next show in June. Yeah, the, the base that Tyler is making is, is pretty wacky. <laughs> the fingerboard inlays are uh, colored from coal from the Titanic. It's, <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> I haven't heard anything about this. Oh my god! I'll, I'll probably talk to him tomorrow, and we'll see. I'll 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 get caught up on this. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. Cool. It, it sounds fitting to Nasty Mammoth. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. We'll take care, Jeff. All right. Later, man. All right. Thanks for listening to the High Desert Lutheran Podcast. I am your host, Perry, from Unga Guitars. And I'd like to thank Jeff Stewart and uh, Tyler for the Nasty Mammoth interview. And, uh, you know, just to touch on it real quick, like I've never really heard of, uh, you know, two builders as a company building a state apart. Uh, Jeff's in Phoenix and Tyler's in uh, here in Albuquerque, and uh, somehow they're managing to get it done. And so uh, thank you, Nasty Mammoths, for being a part of the High Desert Luthery podcast. Uh, to learn more about the High Desert Luthery Invitational, visit highdesertluthery.com, as well as the new YouTube channel for the podcast, High Desert Luthery Podcast. Thank you for joining me. Make sure to press all the good buttons, the, the likes and uh, the subscribes and the follows. And uh, definitely share what we are doing with your friends. We can't help this community grow without you. So thank you for being along for the ride and listening to the end. I will see you in the next one. <laughs>